the last 25 30 minutes with my topic of the top 10 trials of coronary intervention of 2021 okay so as you know the interventional field started with andres grunzik doing the first pc uh, ptca used to call back in 1997 uh, 1977 and 79 and he actually is the father of angioplasty the dream was the catheter-based percutaneous treatment of vascular disease and alert and awake patient, which I added with the utmost safety, appropriateness, and ambulatory. The majority of the patients go home same day. So this is my quotation on top. So I am going to present you data of last one and a half years, which has changed our practice, made the significant impact. So we start with the first one is the imaging trials. So many of them. So basically, when we do the angiogram, you see the coronary angiogram of the left upper top, but then Sometimes it is not clear, ambiguous, but more importantly, to be more precise, we can look inside the artery by various devices. Ultrasound, IVAS has been there, and there are criteria. What is the degree of blockage, whether no, left main or non-left main, then a little more sophisticated called OCT, which is very, the, I would say, detailed images. You can tell you five, the thickness of the cap, and then the lipid which is the NIRS, and uh, Anu has done a lot of work with the yellow trials and many publications that lipid plaque is associated with a higher event rate. And then we came physiological. Borderline lesion, should you do intervene or not intervene, and we do FFR or IFR, basically that look at the gradient across the blockage, and then many studies have shown that doing intervention with FFR, IFR is better than just looking at angiogram. Now we actually have got done, uh, those that were more of the acute data. Now we actually have long-term data that FFR guided PCI or angiographic guided PCI and see here now, there is a lower mortality. So it's lower mortality with FFR guided versus angio guided. Clearly with angio guided, you do less PCIs. Now question is why? It's because the many times it looks 50, 60%, but this is a lesion which is probably lipid rich and of course will not dilate. And those are the ones that you identify, FFR is positive, you put a stent. So key is many vulnerable plaque identification, reduce overall ischemia, decrease stent cost use, and that has been shown by two studies, and SCAR registry also the same way, showing that angiographic guided PCI versus FFR guided PCI, if FFR guided is better with a lower mortality. Now, the patient also, what is happening with FFR in the United States, as you can see, the PCI, FFR guided PCI is increasing uh, with a 75% at present, although if you take all comers, CATH and PCI is about 10, 20%. You say, why FFR guided PCI? And many times you actually end up doing more revascularization compared to just with NGO because m multiple diffuse lesions, which we say 30, 50%, they truly are hemodynamically uh, problematic and create the trouble. And this is, again, similar data for the SCAR registry from United States. Mortality at one year, 0.6 in the NGO guided became half with FFR guided. So now then question comes, you have done the good angioplasty, stent is good. Should you do FFR again or IFR to see whether your stent is working good? There are actually few trials have been done. One of them is the target trial that in half of them, they say physiologically guided incremental optimization strategy that you did a FFR or IFR after the intervention and it is abnormal, you went back, put additional stent and post dilated and turns out to be that overall it didn't make difference. So this is the trial with the FFR uh, showing that slightly better but not significant. So clearly it's a pre-FFR good, post questionable. This is actually ongoing trial called Define GPS where IFR guided PCI versus stent of care uh, is ongoing at present and we'll know after at least two years. Then, should you be using imaging during PCI? The IVAS guided many trials and the ultimate trial, which is now showed the data of follow-up of three years, patients IVAS guided, yes, it's better. Overall event rate lower in the red bar compared to the blue bar of the NGO guided PCI. Now then, we have two tests now. OCT, imaging, OCT and I IVAS, which one is better? There is a trial, a small trial, called Forger trial with the one-year results. And what did they show? Basically, FFR guided versus uh, OCT guided. There are clear-cut criteria how to do those numbers and so. And basically showed that overall, if you see here, 
FFR guided in the blue, the event rate point of view compared to the OCT guided. So OCT guided events rates after PCI were lower compared to FFR. So this is a small trial of about 350 patients, but this field is ongoing and we'll know a little more uh, and in the coming future. And one of the important trials is Illumin 4 uh, by my associate Ziad Ali, who was our fellow, is doing a great job. Really, whether we should incorporate OCT in our practice compared to angiogram. The second, the drug-coated balloon, which actually we don't have in, um, uh, in United States for the coronary. We do have for peripherals, and there are many trials have come in the, at this time. The use of drug-coated balloon, not the stent, drug-coated balloon, and many of them compared against the drug eluting stent, and basically showed that if you have re-blockage, re-stenosis after BMS or DES, so drug-coated balloon works better in the BMS, but in the DES group, it does not have that advantage. So DES, you have re-stenosis, you do a DES again. You have BMS, you have re-stenosis, drug-coated balloon works. And this is the central figure. So what about you do only is a small artery, drug-coated balloon or a stent? What is the data? Picoloted two randomized trial, again uh, about uh, 200 plus patients showing that maybe in a small artery, drug-coated balloon slightly better. You see the height of the blue bar compared to orange. The, and this is actually in Europe, it's happening quite often. A small arteries, they're not putting a stent. They're doing a drug-coated balloon. But we don't have yet, so the trials are just started here, starting here. And so, so overall advantage remains of the drug-coated balloon in the small arteries. There are a few others, uh, other small trials in the past have shown the same. So momentum is there. And very commonly with a side branch. You put a stent in the main vessel, side branch do the drug-coated balloon, and that is what is being done. Now, only question is, drug-coated balloon, everybody aware of the fiasco with the peripherals that have a higher mortality when drug-coated balloons were used for the peripheral artery disease. And question was that, is there any survival disadvantage in the PCI group with a paclitaxel coated balloon? This is the Prisma flow diagram. They presented the data of the numerous trials of the drug coated balloon done for the coronary artery disease. And I'm in PCI, and turns out to be drug coated actually balloon was better. So, what's the signal they saw in the peripheral artery disease is not for the, peri for the coronary um, uh, arteries. And these are the basically showing the where does it basically work, drug-coated balloon, particularly benefit in patient with ISR. And the question is why lower DAP dependence, less neoatherosclerosis, less adherent uh, additional stent, and of course, uh, less thrombosis with the drug-coated balloon. And we are eagerly waiting drug-coated balloon to come. And here is the topic of the colchicine and stable ischemic heart disease, the inflammation, Lodoco 2 trial, uh, has been very elegantly shown by uh, our speakers and, of course, uh, Dr. Uh, Libby being here. So key is that uh, anti-inflammatory really coming into the interventional field via the trials of using colchicine in acute MI. And uh, it works on various factors, uh, um, the platelet inhibition also, adhesions, and basically call coat in the acute MI, showing colchicine 0.5 milligram daily. Only problem is in America, there is no 0.5 milligram, it's 0.6. But the tr tr in the trial was used 0.5 milligram, overall showed in the acute MI population, colchicine red bar was better. And then in a stable coronary artery disease, does it make sense? And again, uh, the large number of patients, about uh, 500 plus stable ischemic disease, were randomized to colchicine 0.5 milligram daily versus placebo. And as you see, in every point, there was a benefit. Question is the death is a separate, but otherwise the less angina, less revascularization. So clearly the patients who are refractory, symptomatic, ischemic heart disease will, or acute coronary syndrome, they will benefit from colchicin. Now issue remain, two things with the colchicin. One is the infection and there is a little signal of higher death rate. Means not significantly, but a little signal. Is it because of the infection, they develop pneumonia, various factors they still need to be seen by which uh, look into, say, the non-cardiovascular death, uh, 0.7 versus 0.5 percent. And then the, all the trials you put together, they actually meta-analysis showing that lower MI, lower stroke, lower coronary revascularization, and cardiovascular death is unchanged. So basically, and the various mechanisms of the
colchicine shown here. So it seems to be, it's a good agent now in our armamentarium, and I can tell you, I have started using it now uh, for last one and a half years with the moderate success, not a great success, but moderate success. But I'm talking about patients who have multiple intervention, they're already on multiple anti-ischemic drugs and so. Then revascularization, low ejection fraction. Remember, low EF patients have been, there are many trials which have compared PCI versus cabbage. But patients with a low ejection fraction have been excluded. Now we actually have some data that this is the Ontario database, ejection fraction less than 35%. They followed the patients, PCI versus cabbage, not randomized, but those who got PCI and cabbage and basically saw big difference in favor of cabbage. Low ejection fraction, patient did better with cabbage at long-term follow-up of eight, 10 years compared to PCI. The, and these are the individual endpoints, so it makes sense since we don't have any randomized trial, patient multivessel disease, your decision is cabbage versus PCI, low EF should be, uh, I would say, selectively uh, pushed towards the cabbage than PCI. The, also in the left main, this is the study from Iris main from Korea, a similar kind of message also occurred in that. Uh, basically, patients with a low ejection fraction, severe LV dysfunction on the right side, have advantage of cabbage versus PCI. In other group, there was no difference. So seems to be left main, complex disease, low ejection fraction, better for cabbage. Then, disrupt CAD3. What it is? Calcific lesion, we have a few devices, and one which we commonly use is the rotational arthrectomy. But it's a very uh, technical device, requires a lot of training, a steep learning curve. People are concerned to use those devices. So now, there is a simple solution for a balloon. Intravascular, intravascular lithotripsy, we call IVL, and basically the concept is that you do a acoustic waves into the coronary, so anybody can advance the balloon. It's a little stuff, stiffer balloon, so you may have to make a room for it, but it's a simple, it does not need technical, you don't need much learning. Uh, and this is a, a, a shock wave, and acoustic pressure waves, fractures the calcium, severely calcified, have been shown by the um, OCT, IVAS, by the Disrupt CAD 1, 2, 3, and 3 was done in United States. Uh, here, again, not a randomized, but a, the overall uh, just a prospective registry of uh, 400 patients, or oh, the excellent results, safety point of view also, no perforation, worked quite well, and more importantly, that it, the endpoints were, which is acceptable for any new device, actually better than that with a great success rate of 92 to 94% various ways. So clearly the FDA approved it, and now it's available, only one issue remains, it's an expensive device. Cost is about $4,700. We still don't have a reimbursement for it yet. They got a little code two, about two months ago, about $1,500, but cost is still remain. And uh, compared to comparative, rotational arthrectomy costs around $1,400, which is for calcific lesion. So where it will fit in, but uh, the company actually went public uh, about a few months ago, with a value of about $6 billion. And it's just approved in the uh, United States, but it has other uses also with the renal stones and so on and so forth, and peripheral arteries. Then we have many trials of the DS. DS has become kind of a default strategy. We don't use bare metal stent, whether it's acute MI, vein graft, anywhere. And there are many trials that still keep coming that whether one stent is better versus other stents are better. And uh, because it's the combination of the drug carrier, stent design, and pharmacological agent, and a few trials have shown that equal results. And one important issue that with the DES era now, whether you have a LED lesion or non-LED, you can see here the overall outcome of the patient with the proximal LED and non-proximal LED is similar. So DES works very well in the large vessel. Then two comparative stents, Bionics and Neuris, showing the similar outcome. Only one was the combo. There was a combination stent and that actually failed uh, against or zero. So I don't think that will be available uh, in the, will come to the United States. Again, another comparative trial of usual, our stents, uh, which we uh, use Onyx versus or zero, similar. So what also came up is what about the polymer free stents, particularly patients who are at high bleeding risk. So therefore you don't have to give depth for a long time. This is the Onyx one trial, which compared the DES Onyx versus Biofreedom DCS, which is not available, drug-coated stent, and basically showed that you give one month 
of debt one month and similar outcome no increase in stent thrombosis or so so seems to be this field is ongoing uh, but comparative but i think the by and large all stents are equal this is our data at mount sinai with a large registry comparing zions promus synergy in a, all cases in complex cases we defined them and overall stent thrombosis was identical seems to be the stent basically has leveled the playing field and by and large all stents perform equally good then left main update you remember the left main the trial of excel which compared in the low to intermediate risk sts uh, the syntax group uh, to pci with the zions stent versus cabbage and the data basically showed three year were identical five year data presented last year and they showed the basically uh, overall while the outcome remained say similar but clearly 3% advantage at five year with the cabbage compared to pci but what bothersome was is the what happens after one year you see here first month pci better than cabbage one month to one year equal but after one year cab the curve just starts separating in favor of cabbage versus pci so what will happen at 8th year or 10th year so that's where concerning is that even in the not high or complex uh, left main where the syntax was less than 32 or below that there is a clearly advantage of the cabbage in this patient so it seems to be that we need to be careful when we make a decision and make the recommendation to the patient and these are the individual end point and what really bothersome was and that was a big uh, lot of in the news uh, that higher mortality significantly p value makes it now at 5 years 13% with the pci and 9.9% with cabbage so clearly we have to tell patients who still want to decide for uh, pci or cabbage these patients that these are the data we have other end points were similar as shown here so this actually has been a very controversial topic that does pci cause more death in patients with unprotected left main and there have, since then there have been a many meta analysis and basically showed once you combine with a meta analysis there no difference in cardiac death or myocardial infarction yes revascularization was a little higher but definitely end point, hard end point in the meta analysis including excel trial was no difference in mi or death so this field still remain i think the jury is out there of uh, selected patient i would say the le where left main is could be well indicated more important is for once you do a left main practice makes perfect means those who are high volume operator they have almost half the mortality compared to the low volume operator so clearly you need to go to a place uh, once you have a left main disease to go operator with a high volume and more importantly use the imaging it has not become the guideline as a class 1 like 2a at present that imaging guided left main intervention and we actually mount sana is not a big imaging lab we do a lot of ffr like 65% plus but imaging we do in less than 10% but cases left main unless there is some contraindication always do imaging in those cases so imaging guided left main intervention has shown to be a better outcome and these are the guidelines again still old uh, based, has, from at least europe point of view low syntax score pci is still become uh, the class 1 indication while in you're not in the united states because those guidelines are still far away but clearly high syntax score patient with left main goes for cabbage low to intermediate appropriate patient could go for uh, pci then prospect trial and absorb trial will for the high risk plaque basically that vulnerable plaque the what is the natural history of a plaque in patient with acute coronary syndrome you have taken care of the lesion and now other lesions you follow them what happens to those patients and those are the prospect one and the same was extended into the prospect two using infrared spectroscopy because it was a the i was in the prospect one and here was i was as well as uh, the infrared spectroscopy same catheter can do both and that was the prospect two trial and uh, basically identifying that what is the predictor of subsequent event in these patients with the uh, who are acute coronary syndrome as you see here prospect two trial for the natural history point of view now published in lancet few months ago 900 patients with troponin positive after successful pci and then you did a three vessel ivas and if there is a significant lesion you did ffr if ffr is non flow limiting it means ffr was more than 0.8 so you cannot do pci 
is not indicated. So those cases were looked into and subsequently followed and rolled in the study. Um, and uh, with more than six, and the plaque burden has to be more than 65%. So also within there, a small group, they randomized to absorb BVS, which is not available now. As you know, BVS, which is the bioabsorbable stent, had a more complication, but that is, was done part of the trial in this uh, small sub-study of the prospect two. And basically what they found, that patients even after you have taken care of the acute, if you see the event further on, in this day and age with a good stenting, the, most of the event occur from the non-culprit lesion. And mind it, all these patients are treated aggressively with various medical therapies. So event rate of 13%, eight, two-third of them occurring from the non-culprit lesion, the lesion progression. And these were the non-obstructive lesions. And then, of course, if you take the, put into the equation that they have a high lipid content of 324 or plaque butter of more than 70%, the event rate is 7% versus could be 1%, seven times higher. Non-obstructive lesion angiogram, negative FFR, the 7% event rate. So just to say that there is something to the plaque uh, morphology inside, and these were the individual uh, lesion level predictors. Uh, which is the lipid core burden index, plaque burden, minimum lumen area. And within there, as I mentioned, the nested randomized trial of the absorbed BVS versus guideline directed, that knowing that there was no clinical indication of PCI in these cases. But should you put absorb stent and patient absorb it will be gone in two, three years, or should you just follow them? And this is actually very interesting. That what happened is that once you put the absorb stent, that your lumen remained better which we expect with the absor. Unfortunately, absor stent is not available. So MLA, which is minim minimum lumen area, was 6.9 versus 3. 3 was the when we started. And then second point was that event rate. With the absor, it was 10.7, and with the guideline director medical therapy was 10.7, and we went down to 4.3 with the absor stent. So more than 50% reduction in event, like almost 60 plus percent. Uh, but just to p-value was 0.12 because a small number of cases. But the concept is there, that high-risk plaque, non-obstructive. If you can perform a stent with a low complication and a stent which will dissolve in the future, maybe the way to go. And you know, the absorbable stents are coming back into the market again. Many of the trials are ongoing at present. Then I'll, the P2Y12 inhibitor trials, comparative, some of them which have been asked earlier. The one was the comparing the clopidogrel with ticagrelor, and this was the LPS trial uh, of uh, 180 milligram ticagrelor with clopidogrel and uh, follow-up. Clearly, by ticagrelor, you have a better platelet inhibition, but overall, clinical outcome of the MI, death, or stroke was identical, but at the cost of, you can see here, that the overall event rates are identical in uh, all, but you have higher bleeding. So now, with the current generation stent, you have higher bleeding of the ticagrelor 11.2, bark 1 or 2, small, minor bleeding, not the major, but trend was there, even in the major bleeding, 0.5 versus 0.2. But key is that should we be using clopidogrel versus uh, ticagrelor in all patients? So this trial shows that maybe the clopidogrel is good enough, 2,000 patient trial. Then, comparing the same thing, clopidogrel against presagrel, and this was one of the questions was asked earlier, which is a Sasekia trial, and basically showed the same outcome. Ischemic outcome was similar, but lower bleeding rate, uh, and so. So seems to be that there is a tendency, if you go to the clopidogrel group, lower bleeding and present, the, compared to the PLATO and other trials which we did in the past, so where the clopidogrel was inferior, but that was a different technique, different stents. The current one are totally different. So these are the pooled analysis of both the trials, overall showing that clopidogrel definitely has an advantage, particularly in the bleeding uh, point of view while ischemic remains. So also another trial which looked into uh, the, the AO patients more than 70 years of age with the acute coronary syndrome, where recommendation is use ticagrelor. So they act or presagrel, so that is what they did, and uh, compare against clopidogrel, and basically showed the same message. On the right side, death am I stroke identical at one year, but lower bleeding using clopidogrel. So well, we have all the trials, uh, Triton, Plato, 
Wall made it class one indication in acute coronary syndrome. But now all of a sudden the trials are being done showing that clopidogrel may be as good and rather lower bleeding. So this many trials will keep going on. Second other question comes, maybe you do a high intensity for one month and go down. This is the trial called Polytac ACS trial, the, the de-escalation. Presagrel you give 5 milligram after one month compared to 10 milligram and basically showed de-escalation of 5 milligram is better. And those who know me, we actually, I'm using 5 milligrams since 2012. The trial showing now, the 5 milligram is better. We only use 10 milligram patients who are more than 100 kilo. So clearly, the small dose of this agent, particularly Presagrol, 5 milligram is good enough associated with the lower event rate and of course uh, the lower bleeding. The most important trial, part of them has been covered by Dr. Roxana Meran, is the DAPT duration trial of last one and a half years. Zions, master DAPT, ACS2. Uh, uh, so Zions short DAPT program basically was that patients who are high bleeding risk, can you cut down your DAPT to one month or three months? They, and they, they have clear cut inclusion criteria of the high bleeding risk patients and gave one month or three months of DAPT. And basically trial design was the, using the Zion assistant and subsequent follow-up. And overall data showed that uh, individual, what were the high bleeding risk criteria, most of them had 1.5 to 2 criteria of the bleeding and showed that compare, comparative, again, it is no randomized, comparative that clearly Zion's 90 on the left side, Zion's 28 on the right side, you see identical outcome of the death and MI. But at the same time, our purpose was in this high bleeding risk patient, do you have a lower bleeding? And answer that is yes. You get a lower bleeding as shown in the 2 to 5, 3 to 5 grade of bleeding, significantly lower by the shortening the depth duration as shown here. Then are you going to cause more stent thrombosis? Answer is no. With the trials, stent thrombosis was, as you can see here, 0.2 to 0.3%, which is what the historical being there. So based on these data, FDA issued one month DAPT indication for Zion's DES on June uh, 28, uh, 21. Uh, Roxana actually had published the data from Sinai also, same, the patients who are high bleeding risk, more features you have, one, two, three, four, you have more chance of bleeding post PCI. Majority of them are on clopidogrel, but more chance of bleeding. And once you have more bleeding, look at the right side, all cause mortality and MI is much higher. Why? Because many times when you bleed, you stop all the medicines, particularly DAPT. And this, uh, this is clearly, I would say, the force at, be, at present has been that cut down this anti-platelet therapy. The major trial was presented in the master DAPT in U European Society of Cardiology uh, two months ago. And basically, in patients with high bleeding risk, you did an abbreviated DAPT versus standard DAPT duration, and one month versus longer, and basically showed important endpoints net event of the ischemic and the bleeding was in favor of one month. Ischemic endpoints were no different as shown here, but most importantly, the bleeding endpoint all showed lower side. No difference in stent thrombosis. So abbreviated DAPT of one month was superior to continuation for one year. And look at the major clinical relevant bleeding from 9.2 down to 6.4 in high bleeding risk. So shortened time duration is better. As shown earlier, stop that too. When you do acute coronary syndrome, you say, let's do this in acute coronary syndrome also. We got very good with the PCI. What about we do it for uh, only one month in patient with acute coronary syndrome? This was a little complex trial, and major, they did an imaging in many of them, used different doses of Presagrol, and so basically showed that one month versus 12 months, there was slightly, 12 months has a little bit numerically lower 2.8% event versus 3.2 means 0.4 lower, but non-inferior. But look at the, if you do a bleeding issue, yes, bleeding was lower in the one month compared to a, the 12 month. But if you say death, MI, stent thrombosis, stroke, there's almost 1% lower in the 12 month group compared to one month. And you put it together here. And more important is the MI. So in acute coronary syndrome, PCI, you decrease the depth for one month is bad. While in stable syndrome is okay. But in patient with acute coronary syndrome, you need to continue longer. As you know, guideline at present is more than six months. 
six months to one year. I mean, one year basically. So we continue. So yes, while we can decrease the adapt in high bleeding risk cases, and more importantly, in stable syndrome, but not in the acute coronary syndrome, as shown by the this stop DAP2 ACS trial. Uh, this actually has been incorporated in the guideline, as been shown there. And then another trial from Korea was that do one month versus uh, six to 12 months, showed similar outcome, but they were all more of a stable patient. So just to say this field was very f flooded. Uh, of uh, the antiplatelet therapy, uh, abbreviation, de-escalation, last one and two years, the twilight type trial, the trichogrel monotherapy, uh, compared to the same trial of the twilight, that after three months, you knock out uh, the aspirin, and clearly the monotherapy did better. We actually have now presagrel also, monotherapy, no aspirin. Uh, the, and seems to be the trials are ongoing at present. So, key had been that cut down the DAP duration, cut down the de-escalate, and take the aspirin away. And that is the most important advance of us in, as an interventional cardiologist. And I'll put it together as my central figure. What did we learn? Uh, basically, various DES types, drug-coated balloon in the ISR, left main PCI, one-month DAP in acute coronary syndrome. Kind of neutral, maybe negative. IVL, high-risk plaque on NEARS, BVS for high-risk plaque, de-escalation of antiplatelet therapy, thumbs up. We're changing our practice. Imaging-guided PCI, colchicine coronary artery disease, cabbage in low EF. Clearly, two thumbs up. FFR use, short depth in high bleeding risk, aspirin one to three months PCI. Multiple thumbs up. And that is where the guidelines should change because practice pattern has changed already to become the better interventionalist. Uh, and this actually, we don't have the data of 2018 yet, but uh, Mount Sinai being the number one in volume and the safety since uh, 1994, since the data have come, and with the significantly lower readmission, that is also one of the important points. And I'll just finish it here to say, overall, the power of medical therapy. And despite all the trials which we have done for the complexity, so you can see in last 16 years, the overall volume of PCI or cabbage has declined 40 to 50 percent in the United States. You say maybe cabbage should go up with the complex cases. No, all have. Why? Because the power of the very good various medical therapy, guideline directed medical therapy, and many of those important topics which we talk today. It's not necessarily the devices, it's basically the overall in number of the procedures, the revascularization procedures, PCI or cabbage, continues to decline. It seems to be the latest data have come that in, it has kind of stabilized now in last uh, two years, but these are from the STS data at present. We still need to wait for the PCI numbers that maybe a slightly one or two percent increase, but after the significant decline in the last 14 to 15 years. But it's a very exciting time, this field continues to evolve to make us a better operator, and that is what we want to do, to improve overall patient prognosis, and hopefully this, uh, today's uh, this, uh, conference came handy, useful to all of you, to, and we brought the latest in various fields of cardiology. Although it's a top clinical, there are some non-clinical, I mean international topics also, but the uh, idea was to bring you the latest and greatest in this field. And thank you very much, and I'll stop here.